production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. This time on Broad and High, we'll peek inside the stone carving classes at the Cultural Arts Center, learn how a local storytelling group is hoping to change the world one woman at a time. The world is shifting, it is changing, and every single person in this room is a drop in that ocean. And a retired journalist shares his love of the music that defined his generation. Oh, darkness, my old friend. This and more, right now on I've Broad and High. With you again. Hey everyone, welcome back to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Quickle. And we've been taping this whole season from inside the Cultural Arts Center downtown. In here you can find an art gallery, a gift shop, and lots and lots of art classes. There's ceramics, book binding, drawing, jewelry making, weaving, and so much more. For our first story today, I decided to pop into the stone carving class. Hi, Kate. Hi, nice to see you. Welcome to the Cultural Arts Thank you. Glad you could join us. Me too. I'm excited to check it out. Hey, Denise, I'm excited to learn about stone carving. Can you just kind of give me an overview of the tools that you work with? Uh, sure. Um, what we're doing is direct stone sculpture. Um, we are usually working fairly small scale and um, using softer stones, such as alabaster, which is what we use most often. Uh, we also use soapstone and limestone. I'm working on a piece of alabaster that I'm fashioning into a uh, sailboat. I'm working on a piece of limestone that will be a butterfly that just came out of its little chrysalis. It might live in the dirt up to here. Stand it up in my garden. Um, and we don't use any power tools. If we were using power tools, we'd be kicking up an awful lot of right. dust and not, not so a good thing. So it's all by hand? All by hand. Uh, so the main things that we're using um, are large files okay. and rasps. And then we have the basic chisels. Yeah, so what, what uh, you do, you want to hold your chisel kind of at a 45 Should I be wearing degree. these? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Safety first. Safety first. And when you're chiseling, you want to look at where your chisel is pointed okay. and not, not at, at the hammer. end of the, end okay. of the chisel. You're welcome to try. Oh, may I? Oh, oh. Some chunks are flying. That seems productive. It, it, it takes a while to kind of get the feel of it, and then you get into a rhythm. Yeah. When but you I, do it's, it more it often. Does, it's surprising how kind of tender it feels. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when uh, I have a new student and they're starting with the piece, I might have them first uh, clean off all the, the rough okay, surface yeah. of the stone. So kind of to, that gives them a, a feel for In this how scenario, it that would be all these kind of jagged right, edges. Right, right. Okay. And so all right. If, if you're not a patient person, you learn to be. You learn, absolutely. <laughs> this is not going to happen instantly. Um, a lot of times, uh, my students uh, are new to this, sure. and so I just want them to get familiar with the tools and the material without a lot of pressure of what it's going to be, what it's going to look right. like. What do you think draws them to your class? I think the main thing that the feedback I get is they love stone. Mm -hmm. There's something about the beauty of stone that draws people and um, to want to work with it, be hands-on, polish it, bring out the beauty. And it's gonna be some kind of 
organic form, but I don't know what it's going to be, but I need to spray it to look at it because otherwise there's dust all over it and it's, it's all white and so it looks like a chuck roast. But this is really soft and it's easy to work on. Do you have advice for someone who's interested in getting involved in stone carving but they've never done it? I mean, you mentioned a lot of your students are beginners. What do you say to that person? Well, we usually start small. Mm -hmm. That's probably the best advice because you want to gain some experience. You want to have the satisfaction of finishing a piece, Absolutely. going through all the steps, um, and finding out, do I really like this? Is it something I want to pursue? And then you can always move to larger pieces or a different type of stone. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. I hope that we get some people interested in stone carving. It's incredible. Well, I hope so. <laughs>what I wanted to talk about is, is less about what I've done and, and more about who I am. Um, I wanted to talk about an influence and a role model that I think exemplifies why we're all here tonight. Um, to celebrate women that are real and authentic and sometimes need a voice. Um, so that's why I wanna to talk to you all about my mother. We've had people talk about loving poetry. We've had people talk about being molested. I mean, it is the gamut. It is just anything that gives teeth to women, gives solid, solidifies their experience to make them um, impossible to discredit because there's too many of us. Our next speaker, Jill, um, was fascinating for me to meet. Um, she told me about a world I knew nothing about. Hi, everybody. So my name is Jill. Um, the world in which she speaks of is the world of police, police work, law enforcement. So I went to a career that is very unpredictable from call to call, let alone day to day. My first training officer was a retired LA sheriff. So he'd been out there with Rodney King. He was like an oak tree. So day one, he said, um, we were supposed to drive the first phase of training. He said, a girl is not driving my cruiser. He said, I've never had a female in the car with me before. We'll see how this goes. I don't really have high expectations. Just don't get us killed. So this was day one. <laughs> None of the conversations have been about being angry. Hurt, pain, frustration, but I have not sat down with any woman who was cussing and angry and vigilant and all that stuff. Passionate, uh, absolutely passionate and concerned, um, but no, not, not violently angry. Hi everyone. <laughs> Um, so I honestly thought this was going to be like 10, 12 women <laughs> talking to each other. And uh, so I took the liberty of stopping by a happy hour on my way here. Cause <laughs> <laughs> so, so I walked in and it's like, oh, <laughs> um, but I am originally from the Dominican Republic. In January of 1994, I was just another college student um, in my hometown of Santiago. 
Um, that's where I had been born and raised and knew everyone. Um, and I had gone through a really difficult breakup. And um, <clears throat> my, a, a dear friend came and picked me up and said, we should go to the foreign student party. It's going to be lit. <laughs> and it's like, a, and in true Dominican fashion, this is like a Monday, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that night I met someone from Columbus who we fell in love quickly. Um, and I don't know for those of you who are of age, um, <laughs> you remember being 20 and falling in love, right? It's like, <laughs> desperate and rushed and like, of course I'll follow you to Columbus, Ohio. I don't know where it is, but <laughs> of course, of course I'll go. Tw 20 years ago on, on a really cold January day, um, I married to this person who I was madly in love with and, and willing to leave behind <clears throat> everything that I knew, culture, family, home, friends, um, comfort, um, because Unlike a lot of other people who are immigrants, uh, my parents were middle class. We had two nannies. I went to French school um, and, and then to private university. So I had no business coming here to struggle. Um. <laughs> so come. If you doubt the things women say, come listen to them. See if that changes your perspective. If you are one of the women who has never told your story, you've kept your story under wraps, Come and find out it's not just you. I read today, quote, we are here to love each other, to help each other, and lift each other up. Historically, women have not always treated one another well. We have been taught to judge, blame, shame, question, and compete. I'd say that's about enough of that. I am grateful for every woman who has shown up. I am grateful for every man who has shown up. Um, and I am overwhelmed by the power of that many people caring. And, and it changes the world, it just does. Visit hearjaneroar.org to learn more about this women's storytelling group and how you can share your own story. Columbus journalist Bill Cohen was a familiar voice to Ohio NPR listeners for more than 40 years. When he wasn't using his voice to report on state government and public policy, he was using it through music and song to encourage listeners to remember headlines from the past. As a child of the 1960s, Cohen came of age during civil rights protests and anti-war demonstrations. His love of folk music and social justice led him to create an annual concert where he shares music and memories of the era that helped define him. What did you learn in school today, dear little boy of mine? I learned our government must be strong. It's always right and never wrong. Our leaders are the best of men. And we elect them again and again. I grew up uh, in Bexley. Uh, and that's where I went to school, you know, elementary school and high school and uh, until I went away to college. I went to college in 1966 until 1970. I spent virtually my whole time, my whole four years at Northwestern, doing two things. Studying, to try to get good grades, and protesting the war in Vietnam. Hello darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. When I got to Northwestern, just north of Chicago, in the late 60s, the place was exploding. I mean, there, there were black activists, civil rights activists, anti-war protests, women's liberation activists, uh, gay rights activists. It, it was just, you know, uh, it was it really, it was exciting. I mean, it, everything was happening there. A few months after I graduated, I got a, a four hour a day job at WOSU Radio. A few years later, after five years of doing local reporting, I went down to the State House, started covering the State House. And uh, I, I was part of the bureau that fed the stories about state government and politics to all the Ohio public radio stations. And so that, that whole thing lasted, you know, 40-some 40, 40 years. 
Come gather round people wherever you roam. Although I had really strong views when I was young about the way that the world should operate, the way government, what government policy should be, very quickly I decided the reporter's job is not to espouse, it's to report and let the public decide, let the public radio listeners and the public TV viewers, let them decide who's right. Give them all the facts. That's the role of the reporter in a democracy. I retired in the spring of, of 2013. Covering all these issues and politicians has been, at various times, frustrating, intriguing, energizing, and even fun. It's been a joy doing this for a living for so long. Thanks for listening and for supporting Public Radio. Bill Cohen at The Ohio Public Radio State House News Bureau. And now I have a lot more time to do all the things that I was already doing before. Uh, but now I have a lot more time to do them. And, and singing and performing is, is one of those top things. The 1960s coffee house thing, I've been doing that about 28, 29 years. I call the show the spirit of the 1960s because what I'm trying to evoke there is that, yes, yeah, it was sex, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but that wasn't what I think is the important part of the 60s. My theme is that the 60s were important because people stood up. They stood up, they risked their jobs, they risked their freedom. Some people risked their lives and some were killed, protesting for civil rights, protesting for human rights, uh, protesting for women's liberation, and especially opposing the war in Vietnam. So I kind of wrote a script that kind of, you know, takes people through the era. An unknown author named Betty Friedan writes a book called The Feminine Mystique. And then I also do trivia questions. People, people love trivia questions. This white TV comedian ran an imaginary campaign for president in 68. Pat Paulson. Well, the last 15 or 20 years that I've been doing the show, I've made it into a fundraiser for the Mid-Ohio Food Bank. I think it's a nice fit between the theme of, well, let's make it a better world. People try to make it a better world in the 60s. Let's, let's enjoy the music and the memories, and let's also get a little money to the food bank. Bill puts on several themed concerts throughout the year. Find out when he'll be playing next by visiting BillCohenSings.org. The painter in our next story uses technology as a means of creative expression. He converts a Roomba, that's a vacuum cleaner, people, into an art-making device. It might make you wonder just who is the artist, the human or the robot? I couldn't handle the implications when I was 20 because I associated it with my identity and I had given that, I, that capability of creating that identity to a robot. My name is Bob Zokaitis. I am a sculptor. I've been living in Arizona for the last six years. Uh, what we're doing here is we are using a Roomba vacuum cleaner to create a painting. Um, and so this is a project I came up with in 2005 and really solidified in 2006. Um, so now it's a decade later and we're re-examining sort of the implications of what it means to have a commercially available product to create a painting. The project uh, started with an assignment in a painting class and it was meant to be, be a self-portrait. Um, as opposed to trying to copy myself and paint, I came up with the idea of what if this was representative of a generation that grew up um, on the cusp of the internet growing up as well. So this is an original generation Roomba vacuum cleaner. Um, without its vacuum system. Totally took all that out. Um, and what I've done is created this paintbrush where we've got a foam um, brush and a reservoir. So it really acts like those like giant magic markers. So the first iteration that I'd gotten a small grant to 
buy a couple of Roombas, buy the canvas, um, and I set it up, hit go, and there was like this moment where I was like, I knew I had made gold, right? Like I knew it, I had this like euphoric thing going on that like is pretty unexplainable. This was 10 years ago, so I mean, there are a lot of things happened that year. Um, but as far as my art production, I realized that all of a sudden this was not empowering me anymore. Now, uh, because I look at art um, from the perspective of a sculptor or a public artist, meaning like I'm making a product, all of a sudden it's a, it's a manufacturing capability, like a manufacturing process, as opposed to a process of identity. And so now I can look at it as a complete new media work with a performance and a finished product. Um, and it's all a ni nice, neat little art package. Whereas 10 years ago, like it was, I mean, I don't let my twin brother speak for me. I'm not gonna let a robot speak for me. <laughs> So if you look at it as a painting and you look at the robot as a tool, um, then you need to uh, control your tools, right? That's what painters do. They have a significant understanding of their brush. Um, normally it's, an, I mean, it's intuitive how they, how they do it by hand. Um, but here you've got to be able to control the robot, which is the brush. And so like while I'm doing it, I'll whack it or like the, you can see a fence set up um, and really getting that control back from the robot, that's the challenge. And so the decisions like color and size of, size of the paintbrush and that sort of stuff are like very important decisions for me as an artist to make because it allows me to control the, the painting. If we're gonna call the finished product a painting, then we do have a successful example of a Turing test. The Turing test is to put a human in one room and a computer in another room and ask them questions until you figure out which one's the computer and which one's human. Now, if you ask the Roomba to paint a landscape, you're not gonna get a landscape. But this robot will create an original work of art every time we set it on the canvas and hit go. Um, and again, if you don't show somebody the robot, right, and you show them just the painting, they're gonna think somebody painted that. And so like at that point, because we think of art as expression, then the dichotomy that this work exists in is, is that the robot's expression or my expression? Because it's the tool, you know, and for a while that's what I struggled with when I was in my youth was that ideal, you know? And under no circumstances am I willing to give up my expression to a computer. I think they are better paintings than I can make by myself. I th and I think it's a better painting than a lot of people can make by themselves. And so if art is about human expression, then they're not, then this is a joke. But if it's art about society, like everybody's got smartphones now, right? And the expression of society, like then why can't a robot make a work of art? Well, that is it for this week's episode of Broad and High. Remember, you can always find our stories online at WOSU.org, and you can check them out on the WOSU Public Media mobile app. Be sure to give us a follow on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're leaving you today with February Thoughts, an appropriately titled track by Columbus's very own Lisa Gain and the Rusty Silos. For everyone here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. And all I want to do is sleep. I don't want to go out. So I'm locking the door and staying inside. I don't want to go out. With February thoughts on my Valentine's Day I want to
to pretend it doesn't exist. It's I work as a researcher for a large uh, research and development nonprofit here in Columbus, um, mostly for government contracts dealing with um, the environment and public health. I really started doing self-portraiture just to have um, images to put on <laughs> Facebook <laughs> for profile photos, and and they just and then I just ran with it. I mean, people had a good reaction to them, and I started getting a little more experimental with them. And um, the iPhone was, was just a way for me to always be able to produce something, always be able to experiment, no matter where I was, no matter what I was doing. Whereas, you know, with the DSLR, you're lugging around a big kit. People are always surprised when they learn that I'm in the sciences and not in, <laughs> in the arts. I have so many ideas. I don't even know what's next. It's just whatever hits me at the moment. <laughs> Catch Columbus at its creative best on Broad and High, Thursday nights at 8 o'clock on WOSU-TV. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you.